Hello there, my fellow space aristocrats, and welcome to another episode in our series on Dune lore. In fact, we could say that this video belongs in the famous characters subtopic too. After doing an overview on the Duke Leto I and the Lady Jessica previously, I figured I could do at least one more episode on famous characters before moving on for a bit to another Dune topic. And what character is more infamous, at least in regards to the original novel, than the dreaded Baron? Ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Vladimir Harkonnen Born 10,110, died 10,193 Siridar Baron of the Gidi Prime World during the reign of Shaddam IV. Vladimir Harkonnen was a person embodying the characteristics of his bloodline to a very high degree. He was shrewd, cunning, and a glutton, carrying a weight of 180 kilograms at the time of his death, aka 400 pounds. He was, in addition, a voracious pederast calling supple bedmates from a nigh on inexhaustible supply of unfortunate slaves. But his greatest appetite was definitely for power. In the final years of the Padishah Imperium, his ambition was to put a Harkonnen on the throne. Had he succeeded in that, it would have been an ironic triumph. House Harkonnen rising from the depths of ignominy to the apex of intergalactic rule. Vladimir was the scion of a family with a long history of ruthless self-aggrandizement. Ethical complacency may condemn its practices, but only with the caveat that the entire Imperium be condemned. The feudal structure of the Padishah Imperium was stable only as far as there was a balance of power among ambitiously antagonistic forces. Constant distrust and the willingness to resort to any means remained the price of security. Vladimir was the third son of the Siridar Baron Gunseng Harkonnen and the Baroness Muertana, later known as the Black Widow, a beautiful woman with the disposition of a scorpion, which Gunseng had married to not out of love, but to form a military alliance with the house Sarobella. Their first son died in infancy. The second son, a Raskin, was a club-footed simple-minded giant standing over two meters tall in his prime. Araskin was famous for his ferocity of temperament and devotion to his mother. Both these qualities can be ascribed to his physical impairment though. He viewed himself as a champion, but frustrated at birth. His doting mother encouraged that delusion, explaining that his condition was due to the genetic shortcomings of Gunseng, whom she hated with a passion. Five years after Araskin, Vladimir was born, while Mortana reared the ostensible heir herself, poisoning his mind against his father. Gunseng possessed a keen understanding of political reality, along with the necessary ruthlessness to manipulate them, and each of these qualities was passed on to Vladimir. If qualities exhibited in childhood would be any indication, then Vladimir was the answer to his father's dream of improving the house. As he grew into a man, he received a lot of training in martial arts, in musical arts, and the political arts, from the best tutors his father could afford. He soon showed a great intelligence, an insatiable hunger for learning, and a great ability to absorb all that he was taught. Although stocky of build, he was well-knit, darkly handsome, with a full round face, and charming in an earthy way. His baritone voice was notable for its strength, its range, and suppleness. The poet Syl Reeve Perrin does provide a contemporary description, and I quote, And what a prodigy he was, handsome and penetrating, with full lips and hearty features. At 18 he was already commanding a strong presence, born to rule. And when he sang, even the cynical courtiers Gunsek had inherited produced crocodile tears of rapture. Perhaps only hindsight enables me to think I sense something evil beneath the strong manly appearance, especially during his most charming moments. Maybe it was his voracious eyes, missing nothing, consuming you as they looked. 
but to witness his quality in fencing matches, key ups tournaments, and musical performances was simply to be impressed with the man himself. Even then, he was the commander of Harko's Praetorians and privy to Gunseng's deepest counsels, which excluded his mother and older brother. It was obvious that he was being groomed for the barony, for how else could it be? End quote. Gunseng's definite preference for Vladimir, an affection that was genuinely returned, would cost him his life. At a state banquet, a Raskin would murder his father and attack Vladimir too, almost killing him before the Menta had a charred in Cleese, stuck a poison needle into a Raskin's neck. That night, Vladimir changed. That night, he would strangle his own mother. And at the age of 20, he had become the Baron Harkonnen that would become infamous much later. Vladimir would rule by very drastic methods. The fate of his father taught him that weakness bore its own fruit, and furthermore inherited a cunning brutality from his grandfather and mother. After the family had seemingly been destroyed, and despite the constant power struggle, Vladimir would prove to be a diplomatic genius. He managed the remarkable feat of rapidly restoring the family's power and fortunes by manipulating several business ventures. During his rule, all the Praetorians and planetary military officials were subjected to deep psychochemical interrogation. Those that failed were simply killed. Anyone with cerebellum sympathies or connections was publicly beheaded. The minor aristocracy was shaken up and brought in line with the threat of their extinction. But Vladimir aspired to a more favorable relationship with the imperial monarch to further his own financial ambition. His immediate goal being Chom Directorship. By this point, the Imperium had grown luxurious, and its bureaucracy was very costly, often to the detriment of the Sardukar, and the military fief donations by the great houses became an avenue of royal approval. Thus, the first tactic was to demonstrating his great loyalty to the Emperor, and voluntarily donated 20% of the estimated annual Ziradnia mine profits to the Sardukar. Vladimir would form lucrative partnerships with lesser houses, while he channeled donations under various labels into imperial accounts. House Corino received royalties under the table, along with military conscripts, raw materials and finished products on kickbacks. Vladimir had an instinct for the timing and placement of all bribes, which ensured him great success. His staggering financial successes were eventually questioned by a Landsrat delegation of inquiry, and to them he said, and I quote, What benefits the Harkonnen benefits the Landsrat, Chom, and everyone else. Those that accuse me of corruption are poor and just envy my success. Maybe the greatest tool in achieving all this for the Baron was the Mentat Chardon Cleese, or at least until his death in 10,162 AG. But by that point, the fortunes of the House Harkonnen had reached their peak. They acquired the melange rights to Arrakis. The Mentat was succeeded then by others, twisted and more distant, and the Baron had them all killed when they had outlived their usefulness. House Harkonnen oversaw the spice production for a percentage rated according to yield. Chom received 20% of the production to be apportioned among Landsrat directors, the Spacing Guild received 15%, the Bene Gesserit received 5%, and House Harkonnen kept about 20-30%, with whatever was left being, air tags, gifted to the Emperor. This contained incentive for producing as much as possible which meant applying the tightest of harnesses and harshest of whips to the subject population of Fremen. Count Glossuraban was Vladimir's eldest nephew and slave driver, exercising Harkonnen enthusiasm, becoming known on Arrakis as the Beast Raban. When the Bene Gesserit Gaius Helen Mohayim demanded the Baron to conceive a daughter for the Bene Gesserit breeding program, the Baron initially refused. He reluctantly agreed eventually, but the first daughter conceived turned out to be too weak for the desires of the sisterhood. Subsequently, Mohayim asked him again to conceive another child. The Baron, up to no good at that point, would stun Mohayim with a neuroscrambler and then viciously rape her upon her arrival, 
conceiving who was to become the Lady Jessica in the process. Mohayim chose to punish Vladimir with a debilitating disease then, that would slowly destroy his physique and make him morbidly obese. Over time, the body of the Baron gained massive amounts of weight, growing fatter with each passing year. He consulted a lot of doctors, including the Sook doctor Wellington Huey, who told him how he actually acquired that debilitating disease. When the Baron attempted to seek revenge upon the Bene Gesserit on Wallach 9, the Reverend Mother there told him that the affliction was simply irreversible. Vladimir thus remained a bachelor and would then raise the younger Fade Raufa, thus he intended to continue the legacy. His weight, by the 10,160s, was so hard on the legs and joints he had to rely upon a cane and later on upon gravitic suspensors just to move around. Despite never acknowledging a child of his own, Vladimir did produce offspring, ironically without even knowing it, thanks to the Bene Gesserit breeding program and the mother Gaius Helen Mohayim. Unbeknownst to him, Vladimir was the father of Jessica Atreides, the official concubine of Duke Leto I. Thus, he did help contribute genetically to Paul Atreides and, in some poetic justice, the unraveling of his own house. Now, although this separate story with Mother Mohayim is actually an expansion of the lore from the prequel trilogy, I decided it did not intrude too much on the original story, so I included it today. In 10,182 AG, the House Harkonnen was in a war of assassins with House Khalifi. It is said that the Emperor himself had to intervene and prevent Vladimir's assassination. After that, the Baron would embark upon the famous campaign to advance the fortunes of the House and destroy Duke Leto I Atreides. Shaddam IV was also quite afraid of the power that the Duke was accumulating, and alongside the Baron, hatched the plan to destroy House Atreides. The Baron would die during the defeat of House Harkonnen and the Sardukar at the hands of the Fremen of Arrakis in the year 10,193. While watching the oncoming Fremen forces, he was poisoned with a Gomja bar, wielded by the young Alia Atreides, Jessica's granddaughter, and, ironically, unbeknownst to him, his very own granddaughter. When he was killed by Alia, House Harkonnen passed to Fade Raufa. This guy would then challenge Paul Atreides to a duel, which Paul won, killing Fade. After that, it passed on to the next living heir, the Lady Jessica, who refused the title. Finally, it was Paul who ruled the House Harkonnen as the next living heir, which then became subsumed into the Imperial throne itself. However, death was not the end for the Baron. Paul's sister, Alia, was born with the ancestral memories in the womb, including memories of Vladimir himself. Alia would fall victim to the Bene Gesserit prediction of abomination, and initially shared control of her body and mind with the ghost of the Baron, gradually falling under his power though. The vengeful and destructive desires of the Baron would prove fruitless eventually, because at the end, Alia did succeed in overcoming the position via suicide. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the infamous Baron Vladimir Harkonnen for today. A good villain, in my opinion, which while having pretty much no redeeming features, at least in the original book, is still not quite two-dimensional. Just like with the other two important characters I covered, you can learn a lot more about his early days by reading the prequel trilogy written by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. What are your thoughts on the dreaded Baron? Was he a good villain in your opinion? What do you like or dislike most about him? Do share these thoughts in the comments below if you want. Now, if you enjoyed the episode, please try to support the series as it doesn't get many views. You can do that by watching, liking, subscribing, and sharing. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and may the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.